Hello, and thank you for joining me today uh, for Real Estate Religion and You. My name is Dr. Sylvia Black. I'm licensed to preach and ordained as a minister, and I have my PhD in Sacred Biblical Studies. And today I want to talk to you on a continued basis of my book, What If You Knew How Much God Loves You? And today we're going to be talking uh, from Chapter 9. Okay, the book will be available soon in Barnes & Nobles as well as Amazon Kindle. Okay, uh, you can email me if you'd like to pre-order a copy. Okay, find out exactly when the book will be available. Now, chapter 9 talks about love and marriage. Okay, now, we all have the desire to love and be loved and perhaps get married. But some people were married young, some people married when they were older, some people were married and divorced or widowed, and then there were those who never married. Okay, uh, or divorced, uh, uh, okay, for one reason or another. Nevertheless, I would imagine that most of us have been married at one time or another, or have had the desire to do so. Uh, we experience different levels of love. Okay. We experience different levels of love from our parents, siblings, friends, mate, your job, etc. Okay, but most of us at some point in our lives have had the desire to meet that special someone with whom we share a deeper, more meaningful love. A big question to consider first is, what is your definition of love? Understanding what love may mean for you uh, may help you to understand whether love is working for you or not. Love means different things to different people, but love is either a word that is never or seldom used or is a word that's often used for the wrong reasons. There's nothing wrong with wanting to experience good emotions toward the person or things you love. However, if you experience good emotions is the foundation of your relationship, or if the kind of love you seek is only demonstrated in today's sex-saturated culture, love for you may or may not come easy, okay, in this particular scenario. God offers us, however, a deeper, more meaningful kind of a love that no man or woman or possession can ever match. Uh, his love is so vast, so intimate, so wide, and so deep that his love cannot be measured, okay, with the human mind or with the windmills of time. God's love for us lets us know that we are not alone even when there's no one else around. God's love lets us know that uh, whose battle we are fighting even if you feel your back is up against the wall. God's love keeps us strong in the midst of chaos. His love helps us not to be afraid when, we all, when all hell is breaking loose. Okay? His love helps us to be at peace when turmoil and confusion sets in. When others are in misery, God's love lets us know that our suffering is not in vain. God's love does so many wonderful things for us. But what if you knew how much God really loves you? True love is of God and comes in knowing God for yourself. He loves us all equally the same. Even when you do wrong, He still loves you. Okay? Um, but if you knew how much God really loves you, would it change something for you in your life? Would knowing God loves you help you to be a better person? What will God's love actually do for you? Okay, now 1 John 4, 8, New Living Translation says, But anyone who does not love does not know God. Okay, for God is love. God is the one who put the need to love, to, to, you know, need to love and be loved in us. Therefore, understanding his design for love is crucial. True love, according to the Bible, is rooted in sacrifice, commitment, and an impulse to be, uh, benefit us all. Now, the bride of Jesus, the church is comprised, oh, today's topic is the bride of Jesus. Now, the church is comprised of those who trust in Jesus and who have committed their lives to serving him. We have a confident expectation in knowing that the situation experienced, okay, is not at all what it looks like. Okay, we all know that trouble don't last always, and that joy does come in the morning. It's morning time. As part of the church, we depend on God for everything. We put God in charge of our lives. We rely on God for protection. We rely on God to take care of us in, his, in ways that we cannot take care of ourselves. 
Uh, we do our part here on earth and God steps in and does the rest. Okay, we are devoted. Okay, we are devoted to God even though there are some unanswered questions. Okay, we are loyal to our God because he will never leave us nor forsake us. And it says so in his, Bible, in his word. He has always been by our side and he is there even when you think that he is not. The church is also made up of those who trust in Jesus and, our, and uh, as, our, as your personal, as our personal savior. Okay, and is referred to as the bridegroom who has lovingly chosen the church, us, which is you and me, to be his bride. Now Ephesians 25, 27, New Living Translation says, For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present herself to him as glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy without fault. Just as there is an engagement period in biblical times, during which the bride and groom were separated until the wedding, so is the bride of Christ separate from her bridegroom during the church age. Her responsibility during the engagement period is to be faithful to God even during his absence. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 New Living Translation says, For I am a jealous, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promise you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ, Ephesians 5, 24 New Living Translation says, As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. At the rapture, the church will be united with the bridegroom, and the official wedding ceremony will take place with it. The eternal union of Christ and his bride will be actualized. Revelation 19, 7-9, the Living Translation says, Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear, for the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this blessed, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are true words that come from God. In the eternal state, believers will have access to the heavenly known, to the heavenly city known as New Jerusalem, also called the Holy City. Revelation 21.2 in the Living Translation says, And I saw the Holy City, the New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Revelation 21.10 says, New Living Translation, So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the Holy City, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. The New Jerusalem is not the church, but it takes on some of the church's characteristics. In his version of the end of age, the Apostle John sees the city coming down from heaven, adorned as a bride, meaning that the city will be gloriously radiant, and, it, and the inhabitants of the city, the redeemed of the Lord, will be holy and pure, wearing white garments of holiness and righteousness. Until God's return, we are to remain faithful to God. Revelation 22:20, 20, a New Living Translation says, He who is faithful, he who is the faithful witness to all those things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The second coming of Christ, believing Israel, is said to make herself ready. This is in keeping with the prophetic program insofar as the kingdom saints did not have the assurance of their salvation. Consequently, they were instructed to overcome, seek, and you shall find, endure to the end, etc. Matthew 6.33 King James Version says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm sure that you've heard that scripture before. Matthew 24.13 King James Version says, But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. 1 John 4, King James Version says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, 
but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out in, into the world. As members of his body, we are accepted in the beloved and therefore complete in him. Ephesians 1, 6, King James Version says, uh, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the blended, I uh, in the beloved. Sorry about that. Let me read that again. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Colossians 2.10 King James Version says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Uh, there's a difference between feeling lonely, and then there's a difference between feeling alone and just being by yourself. You know, you could be around a crowd of people and still feel lonely, or feel alone, or both. Or you could be by yourself and feel lonely and all alone. Okay, you can feel lonely or alone at any time in your life, anywhere, when you're around people or not. You know, it's just a matter of your thinking pattern and what you allow the devil to infiltrate in your head. Okay, and I guess the reason why I never really felt that I was alone or lonely because I always knew that God was by my side. That I always had Him and the angels. You know, there was always somebody with me and that was God was there. But I always had friends too, which, you know, but I didn't classify them as the kind of friends that I had before because I had known those people before for years. They, you know, I still know them, but they're not right around the corner from me anymore. But the people that I had began to meet were new people, you know, so they were like, you know, sort of strangers in a way, but not strangers. Um, and so, you know, being around them, you know, you, you feel you can't share with them certain things that you can share with people that you've known for years or that you've had a special relationship with. And so, you know, you can have that feeling of being alone or lonely, but then that's the tricks of the devil. Because he goes to and fro to see who he can devour, and then he tries to play tricks on you, play tricks on your mind, and, you know. And then it gets you to d doubting God and then turning to serve him. So I decided to commit my life to God. Um, well, I had already went to, I went to church and everything, but I guess I made a verbal proclamation at uh, some point several times in my life. But then this particular time, again, I made a proclamation. I said, I'm going to serve him, you know, <clears throat> um, that I'm just going to commit my life to God. You know, no matter what happens, come hell or hot water, I'm just, you know, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, because, you know, some people have a feeling of being alone, you know, when you're, they just got to be with somebody. You got to have somebody by your side, you know, you got to have somebody in your bed or whatever. You know, this is the feeling that a lot of people have. Because when you're by yourself, especially as a woman, a lot of men, they think that you're vulnerable. Oh, she's not with nobody, so she's available, you know. But that don't mean that I want you. You see what I'm saying? You know, that you don't know what I could be going through or what I'm dealing with. The reason why I'm by myself, you know. I can be getting trying to get myself together. You know, there's a whole lot of reasons why a woman is by herself for a period of time. You know, and, and it doesn't mean that she's got to be hooked up or, you know, in uh, lined up with a man or she got to be bothered with somebody. Or maybe she's involved with somebody. She just, it just could be a long-distance relationship or what have you. Um, sometimes, you know, you invite a guy to your house and whatnot, and then he thinks that he's, you know, going to live there, moving in. You know, so you just got to be careful about even inviting, you know, men to your house and stuff like that. So, um, <clears throat> so I had decided at that point that I was just going to be married to God. I had committed it. I said it out of my mouth, you know, uh, again. But this time I added to it that I said, you know, Lord, I'm just going to, I consider myself married to God. You know, and I'm going to trust you no matter what. You know, and I'm going to, you know, try to keep me safe, you know, because when you're with an ex and whatnot, and he's used to having it his way, you know, if, if we went and got along, we would still be together. But we were together for a long, longer period than we should have been. And then when I finally said no, and I you know, looked him right in his face and I told him to get lost, I had to fight. Fight to keep him away, fight to keep from being used and abused again, you know, fight for my safety, fight for my freedom, and fight for my, my peace. You know, it's a whole lot of fighting. I got another book on that, you know, uh, Get Your Fight Back, You Champion. That's available on Barbara Nobles and Amazon. You know, you got to fight. Anything that's worth having is worth fighting for. You see what I'm saying? But when you tell somebody that you, you know, leave you alone or stop bothering you, or when you decide that that's it, you got to make your mind up in your head that that's what you want to do. You can't, you know, be wishy-washy like it talks about in James. You got to, in the book of James, in the Bible, you got to really be, uh, committed, you know, to your cause, whatever that is. And for me, it's the fact that I was just trusting in God, that I decided I was married to God. 
Okay, um, and then I wasn't going to rush into a relationship, and I was going to choose the kind of people that I get involved with. That's another message I have for you that you know you have to choose people appropriately. You have to you know uh, discern the spirit. That's what God tells us that we have to you know discern them by the spirit, and we have to you know let them know what time it is. You know you just don't just let anybody you know into your world. You know, uh, the, but to, you know to the world, I, like I said, it appeared to be vulnerable and easy target because I was. It appeared like I was by myself, you know, I, 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 uh, but I wasn't, you know, I had, you know, uh, actual, you know, f you know, physical friends as well as spiritual friends, you know, so, um, but, you know, when you don't have nobody, no man coming over, staying overnight or whatever, or coming to visit you, you know, people, oh, she ain't got no man, you know, maybe she's, a, you know, she's available, you know, but they don't think about what you are thinking in terms of whether you want to be involved with them, they're thinking what they want, they're only thinking from their selfish point of view. And then you got to go back into your fight mode. You know, you got to get your pepper spray or whatever, or you got to buy, you know, get yourself a permit, a gun permit, and you know, if you shoot one, you got to be ready to move, you know, whatever. You know, okay, go somewhere else or whatever. Um, but the, the thing is, though, you know, you just have to just stay rooted in God, and God will protect you. He said, I'll never leave you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, He promises us, once we're committed to Him, then He commits Himself to us. We take two steps, He takes ten. You know, you decide that you want to be or committed to him, but you devote your life and whatnot to him. And then he, you know, steps in and he starts to, you know, bless you and to protect you and, and um, keep you. Okay, but now my job was to remain faithful and committed to God, who is my husband. You know, as a church, and we are the church. We are the bride of Christ, and he is our bridegroom. Ephesians 5, 21, 33, the voice says... And the Spirit makes it possible to submit humbly to one another out of respect for the anointed wives. It should be no different with your husbands. Submit to them as you do to the Lord. For God has given husbands a sacred duty to lead as the anointed leads the church and serves as the head. The church is the body, and in her Savior, so wives should submit to their husbands respectfully in all things, just as the church yields to the anointed one. Okay, husbands, you must love your wives so deeply, purely and sacrificially, that we can understand only we can understand it only when we compare it to the love of the anointed one, God, God. Okay, who has for his bride the church? Now we know that he, God, gave himself up completely to make her his own, washing her clean of all her impurity and water with water and power, presence of his word. He has given himself so that he can respect the church as his radiant bride, unstained, unwrinkled, and unblemished, completely free from all impurity, holy and innocent before him. So husbands should care for their wives as if their lives depended on it. The same way that they care for their own bodies. As you love her, you ultimately are loving part of yourself. Remember, you are of one flesh. No one really hates his body. He takes care of it, it, and loves it, just as the anointed one takes care of the church because we are living members of his holy body. <clears throat> this is the reason a man leaves his father and his mother and is united with his wife. <clears throat> Excuse me, the two come together as one flesh. There is a great mystery reflecting in this scripture and I say that it has to do with the marriage of the anointed one and the church. Nevertheless, each husband is to love and protect his, one, his own wife as if she were his very heart. Okay, and each wife is to respect his own, her own husband. Christ is the bridegroom, and uh, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his mighty and powerful and magnanimous word. Uh, Christ is the bridegroom, and the church is the bride, as I've said before, and I'll probably repeat it a couple of times throughout this passage. Uh, we are the bride of Christ, and the people of Christ are referred to as the bride of Christ. Okay, that's the topic for today, bride of Christ. Now, Romans 12, 4 to 5 says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body that we are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Okay. <clears throat> now, God created us all out of love for the purpose of sharing love. We were created to love God and each other, and he refers to us as children of God. Okay, John 1, 12-13 says, uh, New Living Translation, okay, uh, but... To all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God that are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, 
but a breath that comes from God. God created us to have an eternal relationship with Him. He created us in, in, in His own image. So when you're looking at me, you see you're supposed to see Jesus. When I look at you, I'm supposed to see Jesus because we look less like Him. Genesis 127, King James Version says, okay, uh, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male, female created he them. God created us so that we could be one with Christ, a family. That's what it's all about. God created us so that we could be family, children of God. He's our father, okay, our spiritual father. Ephesians 1, 4 to 6, New Living Translation says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do. do and, um, and it came and it gave him great pleasure. We praise God for the glorious grace that he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Uh, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. Some people say God does not need anything from us. And of course, I don't believe that. That don't sit too well with me. But I believe that it's, that it's so far from the truth that, you know, it's pathetic. Otherwise, why would God call us his children? And why would God have created us in the first place if he didn't need us? Parents need their children, and the children need their parents. Just like God needs his children, which is us, and the children need God. Remember Solomon in all his wisdom in his old age, he worshipped other gods, when, uh, which we call idolatry. Uh, David was Solomon's father, and God made a promise to David that David's children would be blessed up, on, up to a thousand generations. But David was a murderer, remember? And, and, and from a murderer to a king. Okay, he had an affair with a married woman, Bathsheba, so he also committed adultery. But he turned his life around. Okay, Bathsheba's husband was named Uriah, and David and Uriah, David had Uriah in front of the line of battle. Uh, they were fighting. He had him killed. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's like uh, premeditated murder, you know, <laughs> in today's society. But Exodus 25, New Living Translation says, But you must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Okay, I lay the signs of your parents upon uh, upon their children, and the entire family is affected, even children in their third and fourth generations. Okay, of those who reject me, and may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of His word. I had talked about that before. That once children are exposed to sin, once the parents sin, now the children are exposed to sin. We're not going to suffer for what our parents did wrong. But we now have to deal with sin because sin was opened up. And it says here up to second and third, fourth generations. You know, so uh, Solomon, God had promised David that he was going to bless his generation. So Solomon didn't suffer while he was alive. He had promised him that even though he committed adultery, it was because he made a promise to David. Okay, and God is a jealous God and I wouldn't want my husband fooling around with other women. God doesn't want his children worshiping other gods. That's the bottom line of that. Okay, uh, I'm going to conclude with this 2 Corinthians 11.2. This is going to be a part two. So this is part one of the Bride of Christ. And I'm going to talk to you about how, you know, why God created us in the first place and why the church we're considered the Bride of Christ and he's considered the Bridegroom. Okay, why and why it's important that we be found without spot or wrinkle. God knew us in that when we was in our mother's womb, you know. He knew us way before we even knew that he knew about us, way before we even knew his name or that, you know, who he was. Or we knew some of some of us, I know for me I knew that there was a power, that there was a power on high, that there was somebody somewhere in the sky taking care of me and keeping me alive. But I just didn't couldn't identify him. I didn't know who it was or what his name was until I found out later his name was Jesus. Okay, and ever since then, I, you know, continued to strive to commit my life to Him. And then I had professed out of my mouth several times that I was going to trust and, you know, lean on Him completely with my all of my understanding. But more recently, then I said, I'm just going to consider myself married to God. Okay, um, which I, I believe may have led me to write this book, but I had already was going to write this book because I wanted to explore God's love in more depth. Um, but knowing that God's love, He loves us all equally. You know, He loves us all equally, just the same. You know, however, you know, when you 
uh, are not a child of God when you sin, you know, that could separate you from his blessings. You know, just consider yourself like you're a parent, you know, when your child does wrong. You know, you say, well, you know, you're not going to go out tonight. You have no computer or whatever. Uh, you know, and back in the day, they used to beat you, you know. <laughs> I, don't know I guess they were trying to beat the smart out of you or beat, you know, beat the rebellion out of you. You know, I don't know what the purpose of beating was supposed to be for other than just to inflict pain, you know. Uh, but, you know, they, there's a law against that now. So, you know, be careful, parents, if you decide you want to beat your child. Uh, it's your child, but you still got a law to have to deal with. But nevertheless, you know, if your child doesn't do what you tell them to do, if they're not obedient to you, then they're not going to uh, deal with the rewards that you have associated with that. And the same thing it is with God. If we're, you know, we're still loved by Him, we still have a chance at salvation by repenting, still have a chance at, you know, going to heaven. There's always a possibility as long as you're alive. But you'll know whether, you're whether God's love, God has separated Himself from you or whether He even knows you or acknowledges anything about you. But I'm going to talk more about this in the next part. So this was called The Bride of Christ Part 1. And I'm going to ask you to holler at a sister. So I'll see you next time. My name is Dr. Sylvia Black. And the name of the book is Why Does God Love You So Much? So I should holler at a sister. Peace out.